Welcome back everyone. Uh, my name is David Anderson and in the previous discussion we talked about introdu introducing the model view view model pattern in WPF. If you haven't watched the first demonstration I did, part one, you'll want to definitely go back and do that before you proceed with part two because we're going to build on all the fundamentals that I taught in part one and we're going to actually extend the demo project from part one as well. So just to a fresh reminder uh, briefly, we originally talked about the introduction to MVVM, what a model view and view model actually means and how to use those and we created a demo project. In part two we're going to discuss multiple view models in this pattern, how you can have a view model interact with another view model, the relationship between the two, and we'll actually do that by extending our demo project. And one of the key concepts that I want to stress from the get-go is that we want to use aggregate component design to keep the components loosely coupled. We don't have to use it explicitly, but just keep that design pattern in mind. And just remember that view models are basically encapsulation. We're just separating our logic from our view in an isolated place that's easy to maintain. And it's not just about over-architecting. A lot of people, when they first learn MVVM or they start getting into it, a lot of it seems overly complicated. In some scenarios, you could have maybe 10 to 15 lines of code for a button click event but in the long run, you have a more maintainable solution. So let's go to our demo project from part one. And let's look at our main view that we had. We'll run the project just to give you a fresh reminder. We had a simple text box with some simple property level validation. And we were using this assertion dialog to demonstrate a theoretical database call to update the name that we type in the text box. So there's a couple things we're going to do um, as a foundation to working with multiple view models and we're just going to clean this project up a touch. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to go to our customer view model and we're actually going to move some things around here and just refactor this a bit. I'm going to move the private fields up here and refactor those to use proper naming conventions and it'll just make a little things a little bit easier for us to maintain in the long run and we'll go to our model and we'll do the same thing Okay, so the reason I wanted to focus part two on multiple view models is because it's one of the most obvious and most commonly asked questions for MVVM. Who is responsible for displaying and working with another a child view? And who is responsible for setting its data context and managing its state? And how does the relationship work between a child and parent view model? So let's dig right into that. So what we're going to do is extend our update button. So when we click that, it displays a child view instead of the debug assertion dialog. So we're going to go to our view models folder and we're going to add a new view model. And we're just going to call this customer info view model. And we're going to do a couple things. We're going to, of course, implement I notify property changed. And we can just borrow that from our customer info view model. Next, we're going to implement a property. And this will be called info. We'll 
go back and declare our private field here in a moment. And we'll just make it a very basic description. Okay. Very simple view model, not a whole lot to it. Now we're going to go a little bit further and we're going to go back to our customer model and we're going to do just a quick little trick and we'll implement I data error info. And this is used for validation in WPF. And you'll see why we're doing this as we work with our child view model. And the way this works is the column name passed in will be the name of a property on this object. So we're going to say if column name equals name, because that's the property we want to validate. And we'll say if the string is null or white space, then we'll say our error is name cannot be null or empty. And then of course we'll return our error because it expects a string in return. And we're done with our validation. So now we're done with cleaning up our customer object a little bit. We're going to go back to our customer view model. And we're actually going to go into our can update command. And we're going to remove this property completely. And now we're going to go into our update customer command. And instead of using this can update property for whether or not the command can execute, we'll say return view model customer error is string is null or white space. Or namespace. So basically we're just checking whether we have a validation error or not on our customer. It doesn't matter what it is and we'll use that to determine whether we can execute our command or not. And let's clean this up as well. So I'll refactor our private field to just view model with a camel casing. And we're done cleaning up our command there. So if we're to run this now, and we were to erase this name, uh, let's see here, we did something wrong. Customer object, I data error info. All that looks good. to say in our update source trigger I believe we need to do validates on data errors equals true. There we go. So now we have our text box adorner. So we can type some information and that will go away because our customer object is valid with a name and if we remove it it is no longer valid with the name. So we're using the validation built in to iData error info instead of property level validation for the update button. Okay. 
Now we're going to dig into the guts of multiple view models. And I'm going to show you not necessarily the best way to work with multiple view models, but this is a proper way to deal with it. And to do this, we're going to go into our customer view model. And what we want to happen is we want to show a dialog when we click our update button. And we want that dialog to use the customer info view model that we created earlier. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to say that we have a parent-child relationship between the two windows. So we'll have our main window, which contains our text box and our update button. And then we'll have a child window, which is the dialog, and we'll make that in a moment. So we're actually going to say that this view model is responsible for displaying the child view model. So what we'll do is we'll create a private field and we'll say customer info view model and we'll call this child view model and we will actually just initialize that in the constructor don't need to do anything special and now let's go ahead and actually create our view so we're just going to create a simple window and of course we will call this customer info view and we're going to change this to a doc panel with last child field equals true and we'll say we want a label and let's say foreground rectangle and actually let's don't forget to set our dock panel dot dock to top and we'll say that this is bottom and we'll say the height is 64 and we'll say the fill is that and then we'll create another label with the dock panel of top And we'll say that the text, or rather the content, is equal to a binding of our property called info. And we'll say that the vertical content alignment is bottom. And we'll also specify a fallback value, just so we can see it in the designer for now. And let's do uh, your data was updated. Okay, and then we'll change the size of this window just to make it a little more like a dialog. There we go. Okay. So now we have our view model done, or excuse me, our view done. Now we can go ahead and instantiate that. So we're going to do that in our save changes method. We're going to say customer info view new and then we'll say data context equals and we're going to pass in our child view model and then let's actually say child view model info is equal to our customer dot name plus updated in the database okay and then we'll say view dot show dialog so to review this a little bit, our main view, which is our customer view model, is responsible for displaying our child view, which is our customer information view. And we're actually storing the child view model state within our customer view model. So the state of this object will persist as long as this object is alive, which in our case will be the lifetime of the application until it's closed. And then on demand we're instantiating the view. We don't need to store that every time, that's just the dialog. And we're saying let's reuse our view model that we're already managing the state for in our parent view model. And then let's change some data on that before we display it. So there's not a whole lot of logic there. And if we're to run this, I can call this and you can see that now we have our 
child view displayed and we can see the information that was passed to it through its view model. So we can close that and we could go ahead and say Bob Marley for example hit update again and now we can see that we have our new information there again. Now let's go a little bit further and actually show that the state is persisted and we'll comment that out so we're not changing any information when we click our command and we'll just say a default value for info is instantiated in customer view model CTOR constructor okay and we'll run that click update and we can see our text is there I can close this click update again information is still there very easy way to display child view models not a whole lot else to it so really when you're working with multiple view models just keep the simplicity in mind don't overcomplicate things and remember that to manage your state your view model will be alive as long as its parent object is alive you can pass view models around you can pass your view models to commands if you want so when we instantiate or update command if we really wanted to we could have updated the constructor to, constructor to take our child view model as a parameter and then our command would be able to work with that view model as well. You can also expose your view model as a property so we could potentially say customer info view model customer info and then we could return our view model and there we publicly exposed our child view model to the outside world so other view models that are unrelated could potentially access this information. So just keep the simplicity in mind. Again, not a whole lot to it. And guys, let me think uh, let me know what you think about the length of these videos, if there's any specific things you would like to learn. Um, that way I can plan these videos with content in mind uh, based around what you guys want. Um, post in the comments if you have questions, you can email me, uh, contact me on my Facebook, Twitter, my blog, any of that. I'm more than happy to answer any questions. And actually one of the questions which is the reason I did this video was from Andrew Larkin and his comment was great video but what happens in a more complex UI where the data context or uh, in a more complex UI where does the data context get set to and can you set it many times and the answer is the context gets set to pretty much wherever you want. You can set it in the constructor, you can set it in the XAML, you can set it completely from a different other class. Um, you can set it as many times as you want. It, you can set a brand new data context every time or you can reuse the same data context every time like we just did here. So all of those are pretty much up to you and how you want to design your application and your requirements. Do you need to persist state or do you not? and that's pretty much it so hope you enjoyed the video I'll have a part three up um, at some point as well thank you guys